Well, as Jesus got to the end of his mission, uh, his ministry on earth, uh, and his disciples, they began to get a handle on who he was, right? It took them a few years because they didn't quite get it at the beginning. Uh, do you remember uh, when Jesus, remember that thing where Jesus said, so who do the people say I am? And then he said, well, who do you say I am? And everybody remember? Who's the guy that jumped up and answered, right? It was Peter. And Peter's like, oh, I think you're the, you're the promised Messiah. And if you remember, two things happened on the heels of that confession where Peter said, you are the Messiah. First thing Jesus said was, Peter, that's right. And that confession, that thing right there, that's the rock on which I'm going to build my entire church. Peter, you're to be commended for all this. And you can just see Jesus saying, okay, they're starting to get it. And so he begins to talk about his death, and Peter totally misunderstands, rebukes Jesus for this, uh, saying that he's going to die. And so Jesus turns around and rebukes him. And do you remember it was pretty harsh, right? He said, get behind me, Satan, right? You've heard that story before. And because the temptation, the reason he did that is because the temptation in Peter's rebuke is the temptation that the devil laid in front of Jesus three years earlier in the wilderness since the temptation that you and I face every single day. And it's this temptation that says, you get to control your destiny. You get to decide how this goes down. You're the ones, and you will, if you just do it your way, you'll have influence, you'll have power, you'll have control. Just do that. After all, you're smart enough, you understand enough to do all this. It's the same temptation he gave to Adam and Eve. Do it your way. Come on, just take control. And Jesus' response to all of this was actually an invitation. An interesting invitation, a surprising invitation. So keep all that as background. Then Jesus said to his disciples, right? This is just on the heels of all this. The commendation, the rebuke, all those things. He just said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Well, what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? Jesus was saying, I'm inviting you to follow me, but that invitation does not look like what you think it looks like. As with each week in this series, uh, we've done this all three weeks, we're going to do it today. I want to look at quickly at an Old Testament story and then a New Testament story that's going to flesh this out before we bring it all home, okay? You guys with me? So let's go to the Old Testament. Uh, and this one is a story that you knew uh, oh, no, very well. If you went to Sunday school, you've heard this over and over. Uh, you've probably read it in your children's Bible. If you have grandkids, you told it to them. And if you remember, the background of this is the Israelite nation has been uh, sold into slavery. They've been conquered by the Babylonians and destroyed the nation, and, and King Nebuchadnezzar, who was the, the king of Babylon at the time, his habit was he would conquer nations. He did this in multiple nations. He would take the best and the brightest, pull them back into his own nation. He'd leave the poor behind. He's like, the poor have no resources. They can't threaten me. So I'm going to take all the best and the brightest and all the wealth and all the smarts and all the intelligence and all the royalty, and I'm going to bring them home, and I'm going to teach them and indoctrinate them in the ways of Babylon. And then I'm actually going to give you positions in my government where they have wealth and power and they're leaders. And in doing so, I'm going to assimilate them. And three of those people were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Actually, they had Jewish names. Those are the Babylonian names. And if you remember the story, they were given this preferential treatment because they were these young leaders. They were given education. They were given special food. They were given more. And, and these three men showed all kinds of aptitude. In other words, they went into Nebuchadnezzar's school, and they excelled. I mean, they took all the AP classes. I mean, they were at the top of the, 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 the pyramid. And they were these foreigners, these Jews, were being promoted ahead of locals because, I mean, they were really just killing it. They were nailing it. And what's interesting is the temptation that these three young men failed or, or were faced, that they did not fail, was to embrace the new culture. That was the entire design. It was to say, we're just going to assimilate we're going to be like the culture around us. And when we do that, we're going to have power, we're going to have influence, and we're going to have control. And there's a little tension in this because that's not how they were raised. And it rises to the breaking point when Nebuchadnezzar does one of those megalomaniac kind of things. And we read it in Daniel chapter 3. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, 60 cubits high, 6 cubits wide, and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Just so you know, that means it was about 90 feet tall, about 9 feet wide. It's a big statue. And then he summoned 
the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, basically everybody in charge. And remember, these are not just Babylonians. These are all the other people he conquered as well. He's bringing them all together. And all the provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image he had set up. And when they showed up, the herald proclaimed, nations and peoples of every language. See, again, this he's trying to pull them all together. This is what you're commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipe, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will be immediately thrown into a blazing furnace. Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, and all kinds of music, all the nations and peoples of every language fell down and worshipped the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Remember, this was a very strategic megalomania. Puts them in the center of everything. But it was to get everybody to ignore their gods, their traditions, their home countries. It's like Nebuchadnezzar saying, forget about all that. Embrace what's in front of you. This is the culture. If you do this, the path is paved for you to have a good life. Embrace the now. Well, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, of course, if you know the story, they said, well, we, we can't do that. I mean, they had, been, they had grown up in, uh, at least to at some level, before they were probably teenagers when they were taken, but they had enough grounding to know this isn't the way of Yahweh, the Jehovah, the God of Israel. This is not what we do. There's only supposed to worship Him and Him alone and so we're not going to do that. It was, it was contrary to their fundamental belief system. And they refused. And it wasn't showy. They just refused to do it. They weren't going to embrace the culture, and they weren't going to follow the king's command. And so, of course, all the people that were around them who wanted their positions did what? They tattled on them, right? And you can read it. It's, it's, it, it sounds so childish, but this is what they did. They're, they go and they, they, they just can't get to the king fast enough. Nebuchadnezzar, did you see... See, those foreigners, yeah, the ones you were promoting, the ones you think that are so good, they're not doing it. Man, I don't know what that says. I mean, I would bow down before the statue, but they're not doing it. I don't know what that says about them. They probably won't listen in the future. Like, you can just see all this going on. And so Nebuchadnezzar calls him in. He confronts him. He's furious. He's, he's angry. And uh, he says, look, I'm going to give you a chance to do this again because I do like you guys. I mean, you're at the top of the class I really want to have you in on this. You can just picture this. I, the drama of this scene would just, the tension would have been so thick. And the key for all of this and the key for this morning is contained in their reply. Here's what they said. Again, you're probably very familiar with this. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. We are called to something bigger, something larger. There is somebody else who holds our ultimate loyalty, and it ain't you. And we cannot give it to somebody else. He's powerful and he can save us, but that is not the determining factor in our loyalty. It's because of their belief in God himself. And of course, if you remember the story, Nebuchadnezzar is like apoplectic. I mean, he's so angry. He says, heat the furnace up, throw him in seven times hotter. The people that throw him in die. And you remember, it's a great story, right? Because he throw him in and all of a sudden he looks, he sees a fourth man in the fire. And a lot of people believe that's the pre-incarnate Jesus walking in the fire with them. Not only they're not burned, they, they just, they, they're not even harmed. It didn't smell like smoke, you remember? Paul, who wrote most half, half the New Testament, you're all very familiar with him. He wrote a, a ton of the books that we read. And if you remember, he was this ideal religious guy, did everything right. He, did, he, he went to all the services. He read the right things. He did the right things. I mean, he was zealous for God, and he thought it was his mission from God to stamp out and eliminate the church. He thought that was a stain on Israel. He thought that it needed to be gotten rid of, and so he wanted anybody that claimed to follow this Jesus guy to be imprisoned or executed, and he put a lot of energy into making sure that that would happen. And if you remember the story, on one of his trips to round up some more of these guys, he was met on the road by none other than Jesus himself. A really bright light knocks him to his knees, uh, and Jesus spoke directly to him, and 
Paul didn't even know who that was at the beginning, uh, but you know, he gets, Jesus identifies himself. And it's, it's funny, you can read the whole, the whole story, but what I think is interesting is what Paul said when he told the story. Because you know how when you tell the stories of your past, you tell the story. Well, later, Paul gets a chance to tell this story, and he's standing in front of a group of people, and here's what he said. He said, when all this happened, here's what Jesus said to me in the middle of all that. Now get up and stand on your feet. This is Jesus talking to Paul in that road to Damascus experience. I've appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen and will see of me. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I'm sending you to them to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Don't you catch this? God is, it's a very strong invitation, but it's still an invitation of God saying, I have something for you. I got something for you to do. And Paul, it's going to cost you. Not to restore his sight because Paul got blinded in the midst of this. And here's what he told Ananias. The Lord said to Ananias, go, this man, Paul, he's my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Let me ask you this. How would you respond to this invitation. Hey, Paul, I want you to follow me. It means the rest of your life you're going to suffer. You all in? And you know what? It's not exactly enticing, is it? But God wasn't kidding. Because at the end of his life, he was writing a letter to the church in Corinth. I know I'm throwing a lot of scripture at you this morning. Hope you can track with me here. This is what Paul wrote. He says, I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. And we blow by these so fast. That was so painful. It killed people. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a day and night in the open sea. That means probably floating on a piece of debris. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from the Gentiles, basically everybody. In danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, in danger from false believers. I've labored and toiled and have gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I've been cold and naked. And besides everything else, I face daily the constant pressure of my concern for the churches. My friends, if you were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, living in a strange land, thinking to yourself, God has abandoned our country. He's put us here. Let's make the best of it. Would you follow God's invitation to put him first in the face of someone like Nebuchadnezzar? Or if you're Paul, who has this invitation to be an emissary of God, and you know you're going to suffer, and that's his invitation, would you take it? Understanding the times that we've been talking about is not an intellectual exercise. We are not trying to strive to understand the times so we can have better Facebook posts or nicer conversations. We do not look where God is working to bring culture so we can say, good on, go for it, God, do your thing. That's not it. We don't embrace new methods when they're convenient for us or when it fits in our schedules. Because at the heart of all of this, it's all about the invitation to surrender. I don't know what version of Christianity you grew up with. I've had lots of conversations with different you in different points in time. And we all have different experiences of when, where, and how Jesus invited us into a relationship with him. Some of us did it when we were really young, you know, like six years old, uh, seven years old. Some of you had it when, it was, when you were an adult. Some of you as teenagers. But the invitation, regardless of when it happened, has always been exactly the same. And it's simply this. If you want to be my disciple, deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. Surrender your life to me. It's not a one-time thing. This is not a pray a prayer, 
Come to know Jesus, surrender your life, and then move on with everything you want to do. That's not what this is. It's a daily, everyday, ongoing, regular, I'm surrendering and yielding my life to you. And why I'm talking about this this morning is all the things we're talking about as a church, all the things we're saying about understanding the times of leaning into it, all of it is irrelevant if we are not surrendering to him. Because here's the thing, to surrender is to yield control. When Jesus picked, told people to pick up their cross and follow him, it's not what we see today. Do you know when you think of a cross today, right? It's what we tattoo on our arms. It's what hangs at the bottom of our necklace chain. I mean, that, that's what the cross is. It's an icon. It's a symbol of Christianity. It was not that when Jesus said this. He hadn't died yet. So when he said to the disciples, you pick up your cross and follow me, do you know what they knew? Because daily or weekly or at least regularly, they saw people dragging their crosses to death where the Roman soldiers were letting them take their crosses up to be executed. So to carry your cross meant you lost. You were beaten. Rome had won. And you lived completely, whether you lived or died, was completely at the whim of the government. The cross was a symbol of shame, of subjugation. I mean, the nation of Rome had prevailed and you had no more say. Your life was in the hands of another. That's the invitation Jesus gave his disciples. That's why when he started talking about death, Peter said, what are you talking about? I don't want that. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said this way, when Christ calls a man, he bids him to come and die. To surrender is to die. Well, what does that mean? You've all heard this. You've all been church people. This is new for you. When he says to take up your cross and follow him with a willingness to die, it means I decide that all the things that matter most to me, and that's the things I want, the things I wish I had, the, the pleasures, the glories, the entitlements, the security, all those things I work so hard for, my reputation, my money, my retirement, I give up control of all of that to you, God. So many of us want to do God to do amazing things through us, don't we? I mean, if I went around and said, you want God to do amazing things through you? You'd be like, yeah, of course I do. That'd be amazing. But too often we want it to happen on our own terms. I ran across this quote recently. It said, the tricky part of the Christian life is that before you can experience Christ's resurrection power and new life, you must first be united with him in his death. I find so many people attempting unity with Christ in his resurrection and trying to bypass unity with him in his death. To surrender is to yield control and to let God manage the results. Think, think of the two examples we just gave you this morning. You know Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? They stood in front of the most powerful man on earth. I mean, they had to have been just stomachs churning. I mean, this was not just a laissez-faire thing. They were nervous. They, were, they didn't know what was going to happen. And they said, you know what? God might save us. God might not. We're going to follow him anyway. Paul said, I'm going to follow you, God, on your mission in spite of the difficulties that are in my future. I don't even know what that's going to look like, God, but I'm in. To surrender is to trust that God is good and that Anything and everything we yield to God is for our ultimate good. And in some cases, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, it all turns out great. God shows up. They're saved. God is, they end up with positions of power in the government. And God is glorified. Other times, like Paul, God is glorified. And he suffered. In both cases, to surrender was to find life and freedom. That's the third thing. To surrender is to find life. That was the whole word that, that the worship team had up to is life. What makes three men defy the most powerful man on the planet? Really. What makes a man spend his whole life in pursuit of a mission that caused him nothing but grief, at least physically and circumstantially? What makes a young man decide to say, I'm going to Africa for a year. And what makes his parents bless that? 
It's people who know that surrender is the path to life. Jesus said, the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. I come that they might have life and have it to the full. Do you know that the only way to that is through surrender? There is no other way. Anything else is a shadow, a copy, an imitation. Here's the cool thing. When you die to Christ, God has no interest in keeping you dead. He just wants to kill the thing that's killing you. There is no glory or achievement or security or anything you can get that will touch the glory of the Father when you experience it in your life. And it seems to me that this morning this word is for us collectively as a church and individually. And so we're going to do something this morning. We stand on the edge of something new as a church. We, times are changing. We're trying to understand that, and we're going to have to adapt, and we're going to have to use new methods. And when we do this missional outpost, and as we look at what we're going to do with the youth group, it's going to be new. It's going to be different. It's going to be uncomfortable. It's not going to look the same, because that's what God does. And for each of us, we stand on the edge of intimacy and something glorious with Jesus if we're willing to surrender. So here's my question to you and what we're going to do, a little exercise. We're going to take a couple minutes. Where have you, and this is, I'm going to give you two questions. But the question is really, where are you yet, to, where have you yet to pick up your cross? Because it's a very personal question. Many of us have yielded to God. We say, oh, I've done this. And we've yielded 50, 60, 80% of our lives. But God wants it all. So I'm going to ask you these two questions. What is Jesus inviting you to surrender to him? And what keeps you from doing that? And for those of you that think this is, you've done all this, let me ask you. There's so many ways where this plays out. Some of you maybe harbor fear that if you truly yielded your finances to God and your retirement funds, that he would make you give it all away and you'd have nothing left to do the things that you want to do. Perhaps you think if you surrendered your schedule to God, he would make you busier to do more things with more people than you're comfortable with. It might be that if you surrender your appetites for food or sex or anything else, that your life would be bland and it would be boring. Maybe you feel that if you desire, surrendered your desire to have a spouse, to be married again, that God would make sure that you lift your life alone. Maybe you feel that if you yielded your career to him, he might make you become a missionary. Or even worse, a pastor. I don't know. Maybe if you yielded or surrendered to God what people thought when you confessed, that you would just be rejected by everyone. Maybe if you surrendered and spoke up and did something outside your comfort zone, all you think that would happen is that you'd be humiliated or embarrassed, especially when you made mistakes. Perhaps if you surrendered your anger and forgave, you would think that all that's going to happen is you're going to get taken advantage of. I don't know what that is for you. The list could go on and on. I think most of us miss the point. Every one of those excuses says, God, you're not good enough. You're not powerful enough, and you don't love me enough, so I'm going to keep control of this part of my life. So here's what I want you to do. I'm going to give you about three or four minutes. There are four stations, six stations actually, two on each side, one at the back, one at the front. And I want you to come up, grab a pen, grab a sticky note, and I want you to put on there Just in one word, what is the thing that Jesus is inviting you to surrender? And then you don't have to write out the rest, but I want you to think, what is it that's keeping me from doing that fully today? Okay? So go ahead. Yeah, why don't you come on up. Faith, just why don't you play a little bit. gives us a little bit of background when we do this. But get an idea. We don't have a ton of time, so I want you to do that. Um, And uh, just stick it to the wall. No one's going to read these later. This is a declaration for you to say, God, this is something that I struggle with. Sometimes it's our dreams. God, I want this thing so bad for my kids. I want this for my grandkids. God, I want this for our church. To surrender and yield it to him. To say, it's all yours. What is it for you? Go ahead and do that. We'll take about four or five minutes. There's a preacher named Henry Varley 
couple hundred years ago, hundred years ago, he said this. He said, the world has yet to see what God can do through a man who is totally yielded to him. The person who heard him say that was Dwight Moody. And you've heard of him. He was a preacher and he uh, pastor. And he heard those words and he resolved to be that kind of man. At his funeral, attendees were told that even though Moody had had no inventions, made no discoveries, he wrote no poems, painted no pictures, he didn't lead any armies, he didn't do anything like that, this unlettered or uneducated son of a poor woman made an impression on the world that had been seldom seen. Those things that you all wrote down are the things you thought about that you didn't write down. Our fear of yielding control of those things to Jesus is based on the misconception that he's out to rob something from you. And what God is saying is, no, give it up. It's controlling you. It's owning you. Don't let that be. I'm good. I love you. Whatever we do together will be for your best. And it seems like a risk, doesn't it? I know it does to me. But a fully surrendered person is the, in the least risky place that anybody could ever be. So as we go into this fall, as we embrace this missional outpost, as we do new things, let's understand what's going on. Let's, let's put our energy into it, embracing that God is doing something new. That it's going to take new methods and new ways of thinking. And the only way that we are going to embrace all of that is if we say, God, I surrender. I yield. I'm tired of doing this on my own. You do it.